So, um, welcome everybody. This will be um, my final lecture in, in a wonderful series that I've enjoyed very much. I hope the uh, many of the followers and uh, attendees have appreciated this. So, I'm, I'm going to address today um, a, a fairly deep question about how far we we can go, how far we understand um, the grander themes of of the universe. And um, I'm going to touch on various things that um, involve the past and the future, the very long-term future too. But let me begin with um, a wonderful quote by Donald Rumsfeld. As we know, there are no knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are unknown unknowns. Uh, but there are also unknown unknowns the ones we don't know, we don't know. Uh, and of course, this, this got him a certain distance too uh, in, in the past. But I, I want to, there's so much that we are unaware of and that we are unaware we are unaware of, if you like, about the universe too and our future, etc. And I'll try to explore the stuff that we at least do know that we don't know in this talk. Bearing in mind there may be stuff that we don't know what we don't know. Okay, so uh, the, the, our place in the universe, I want to give you some feeling for that. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I work on the, 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 large, the large things in the universe and basically what the universe is made of. I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, the matter, the energy. And then um, greater things, which I think could make a profound difference to humanity, uh, life out there, alien life, and, and the future of not over the next tens or hundreds of years, but the very long-term future for the Earth. And I'll give you some thoughts on that. Okay, so um, let's begin with this um, wonderful drawing by Robert Flood, um, made around the time the Gresham college began really um, and he was a physician an astrologer a mathematician a cosmologist a kabbalist ro rosicrucian many things which one could be at that time it's harder now to combine all of these disciplines although i i can think of one or two people who try but um, uh, anyway he he was profoundly influenced by the idea that man, humanity, is at the centre of the universe. And this was a, a, at the time really um, when the Copernican revolution hadn't happened, um, hadn't quite happened. And so there was much debate about um, whether the Earth was at the centre of the universe, etc. And it got displaced by Copernicus uh, around this time. Um, for the sun being at the center, and since then even the sun has been completely displaced. It's just one of many, many stars out there. But the notion that um, we are central, you know, um, and our, our perception is that everything else out there maybe is uh, humanity related, perhaps we're very wrong. Um, there may be some very unusual, interesting forms of life out there. Perhaps we've only come to realize this in, in recent years. I'll tell you a little bit about the logic behind that. But the thought that um, man is central goes back a long way. And it even influences us in cosmology because we um, uh, feel, many of my colleagues feel, that it's um, hard to um, imagine a very different universe uh, without which might be hostile to life emerging in it. The conditions might be too hot, too cold. It's a bit like, you know, the story of um, uh, the three bears, you know, Goldilocks and the three bears. Uh, there is a place that's just right, right? The ball of porridge is just right for the right temperature. So it could be the universe is, is in that way connected to um, our presence. And that's a theme that is very, very common in cosmology. We, do, we actually don't know the answer to this. Um, but it seems that... Um, this is probably um, a way more of understanding our lack of the final theory of the universe because um, if we really understood the basic laws behind it, we maybe might not need to put um, 
our presence in such a central role in our thoughts about you know, the, the grand scope of the universe. But, but let's begin um, with this um, beautiful um, vision of what has been called the cosmic Euroboros. Um, and so here you see um, all the possible scales that we study and conjecture about. And so let me take you from you know, the many, many millions of light years, as far as we can see, the distant galaxies, um, down to um, uh, subatomic scales. Okay. Um, and then the scales of humans over here, meters, scales, that's what we sort of are on. Um, the, the scale of the sun, okay, and then um, and the scale again of, um, of um, uh, the very smallest scales, getting down to um, uh, microphysics, the fundamentals of what atoms, particles might be made of. So from larger scales all the way down to stars, galaxies, then planets, people, sub subatomic stuff. Um, the famous Higgs boson discovered a few years ago, the missing link in particle, a model of particle physics, the fundamental model. The big unknowns like dark matter come to that in a moment. All of this, you know, one, one beautiful circle, okay? Um, one has to understand all of it to make sense of any one of these, actually. That's sort of the message behind this. And we're sort of a long way from this, but at least we can get some feeling for the general scheme of things. Okay, so um, the... Maybe the greatest personality in all of modern cosmology, I was a very unlikely person, um, a, a priest who got ordained after he got his PhD in physics, studying black holes actually at MIT, but he's a Belgian, he went back to Belgium to live there, and um, eventually he was, um, became very well known in, in the Catholic Church. He was the primary scientific advisor to Pope Pius XII, and he in fact largely wrote for Pius XII, the famous um, um, text which describes the, um, the first views about the universe that said it's fine to have the Big Bang, etc. It's all perfect well to combine science with, um, with religion if one sort of separates the beginning after the beginning, before the beginning. That was basically Lemaitre's view. Anyway, in his notebook um, in the mid-20s, he sketched his ideas about the universe based on the newly developed theory of gravitation by Einstein, general relativity. And so in, according to this theory, one could figure out the uh, possible histories and possible futures for the universe. And so these are a number of different models that Lemaitre sketched out in which the size of the universe is shown here, and it, it's, it's growing bigger and bigger. And that means all the galaxies, all the space we can see around us is growing, but gradually slowing down in this model and then collapsing to here, we call this now the Big Bang, this would be the Big Crunch. That was one possibility. A Big Crunch awaits us, right? Which, you know, it might be bad, but in a few billion years, perhaps. And then there are other models um, which keep on slowing down due to gravity, and then, but just keep on going forever. And th this is a, a bizarre place, too, because that means the future being incredibly diffuse and cold, um, no more stars could be seen, whatever, everything would be so far away. And then uh, an even uh, more intriguing suggestion, totally radical at the time, was that in the future the universe might begin to speed up and get even bigger and bigger. And then not only would we not see the distant stars, we wouldn't even see our nearest galaxy. Everything would have moved out of our possible vision region that we could even see. And so these were three different possibilities. And... Um, uh, and so it took, you know, 50 years, half a century, um, and there were endless debates about whether um, this idea of an accelerating universe made any sense at all. And so um, Einstein, who um, uh, famously could speak French, among other things, was exposed. Lemaitre told him about his theory in 1927 at a Solvay conference. And... Um, Einstein said, your calculations are correct, but your physics is abominable. Okay, so he just did not like this ugly notion that suddenly, after the past and the presence of the Big Bang, the universe would suddenly begin speeding up again. That involved a new force, okay, in nature. Um, but Lemaitre did persist. Um, 
with his theory and his, uh, and his, uh, his arguments, the first thing he did was convince Einstein that the universe even was expanding because at the time Einstein made this comment, the idea of a static universe seemed so natural. There was no evidence you know, that said that wouldn't be the case. But eventually, uh, the, the case was made within a, within a very few years. And you see Einstein in this carefully posed photograph with Edwin Hubble uh, in, on Mount Wilson looking at something, uh, who knows what, um, a star or something. And Hubble was the person credited with the discovery that the distant galaxies are receding from us, the expansion of the universe. And... Um, and within a year or two, Einstein and Lemaitre are going on lecture tours around California. And after one of them, uh, Einstein said, this is the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of creation I have ever listened to. OK, that was Einstein and Lemaitre. So Einstein was a flexible man. He could change his views. He realized the evidence said things were moving away. The universe wasn't static. And uh, he accepted that. But... Um, there was one more part to the story, um, which is to do with the stuff that um, we don't see. Um, so I've talked to, you know, we all know there are atoms out there that make the stars that we see far away, that make us. And there is this stuff called dark matter. I'll, I'll show you, explain examples of that in a moment. But even more than, than dark matter, there's a mysterious thing called dark energy, which is what is causing this very relatively recent speed up of the expansion of the universe. And it's a mystery. It composes most of the mass energy of the universe, 73% or thereabouts. And the sad thing about all of this is we have not the slightest understanding. Uh, we think we understand atoms pretty much, but we don't know what the dark matter is. We don't even know what the dark energy is. So this is one of the biggest challenges to our current understanding of physics. Um, <coughs> OK, um, so let me say a few words about this mysterious stuff which dominates everything. We call it dark energy um, because we can't see it directly. And it's got energy. It's got, it, it acts like anti-gravity. It's like this magic stuff that can push the universe apart. And so the reason it is out there and does this is that what we think of being emptiness, we call it the vacuum, is actually not really a vacuum at all. It contains a tiny, tiny amount of energy because little particles come and go all the time. But on a time scale so short, on a distance scale so short, that they're unmeasurable. And because they come and they go, energy is conserved. We're not violating anything. We just can't measure it. But the effect of their coming gives you a sort of a pressure. We call this the pressure of the vacuum. And it's a prediction of the quantum theory. And so um, now pressure, ordinary pressure, gas pressure, the pressure of a gas, it does have energy and it, 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 it attracts. It's like gravity. But if I have, but this mysterious quantum stuff is anti-gravity. Let me just try to explain why with this very simple analogy. Um, imagine a piston compressing a gas, then you get more pressure. But the volume is smaller. So there's less of this mysterious quantum stuff. But now if the piston goes the other way, and you expand, you get more and more volume, OK? So ordinary pressure goes away. But this mysterious new pressure from the quantum theory suddenly gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is what Lemaitre speculated about and finally was measured half a century later by astronomers. Um, OK, and so we believe the universe is accelerating, but again, this is, you know, we go in circles here because there's a problem with this. It turns out that this weird stuff, which is accelerating the universe, is due to what Lemaitre called the cosmological constant, this anti-pressure. It's only coming into play now. It's a tiny, tiny pressure um, in the present, roughly the present stage of the universe. But the physicists um, who work on the very early universe, extreme states of matter, they can estimate the strength of this, this field. And they think it should be enormously larger just from the way high energy physics works. And we've called this, uh, this overestimate. It's, it's enormous. It's many, many factors of 10. I can't even count all these trillions for you. But it's called, been called the worst prediction of physics, what it, this, this acceleration should be and what we actually measured it to be. So um, that's just one more example of how little we know. And, um, the response of the scientists has been, you know, that we need a new theory that combines gravity and 
the quantum theory. So far, we've had no success. Stephen Hawking spent much of his life wondering, wondering about this and didn't get anywhere on this theory. Eddington before him, likewise, and um, Einstein even too. Um, but, so we're waiting, perhaps, for a new genius to, to emerge who will tell us what, um, what, where all this may be coming from. And, you know, if you think about this, all, all of these figures, you know, basically the past century, so we have a long way to go. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic we'll find a solution and we'll come to how long a time scale we may have to wait in a moment. Before then, uh, let me tell you about the other mystery that perturbs astronomers greatly because we, we measure these things out in the sky. We measure their effects, but we don't know what, we me what, we, what, what we're actually measuring. So now let's get on to dark matter, which is a bit more tangible than dark energy because dark matter is everywhere, we think. It's in the Milky Way, in our galaxy, whereas dark energy is so small, it's locally I measure. It only comes to play on very, very far away. But dark, dark mass, dark matter is there. And so this is, a, for example, an, an image of a galaxy like our own. And all this stuff around it is dark, OK? And so but we know this because we measure the speeds of these stars. And they basically are simply moving faster than they should be, being accelerated by some stuff around us. And so these are the two pioneers of who first invented, measured this effect. Um, uh, way back in the early 50s, uh, Vera Rubin and Mort Roberts. She used optical telescopes, one of the first women to basically uh, go into facilities on top of high mountains, Mount Palomar, where there were no facilities for women, actually. So for her, it was really hard work. She had to go down every night. Um, and Roberts, who was a radio astronomer, measuring much the same thing, but further away from the galaxies, measuring this weird extra force that uh, seemed to, you know, soon became... Um, alleged to be dark matter. And so that's the evidence for it. And there was another astronomer way ahead of his time, very unusual person, a, um, a Swiss-American called Fritz Vicky, certainly Pasadena eventually, who measured these things. Um, so this is, this is a galaxy, hundreds of thousands of light years across. This is a cluster of galaxies, many, many galaxies. These are um, millions of light years across. And again, these will all fly apart were it not for dark matter. So dark matter seems to be Pervading stuff, it dominates all the ordinary stuff, the ordinary stars, it's out there. And, we, and our mystery is that today that we don't know what it's made of. So let me just um, explain very, very briefly how we measure, how we're so certain it's out there. There's simply no challenging this. So Einstein's, one of his great predictions was that when you look with, with a telescope, in this case a space telescope at a distant star, then if this... Um, if there's an intervening galaxy full of dark matter, basically the light gets bent. The light paths get pushed around by the dark matter, just like a lens. Dark matter acts like a lens because it, it basically dark matter bends light paths, and that's how you know that's what you know. Ge ge geometry is a manifestation of gravity. That was Einstein's great thing. Okay, and so but the practical proof of that, this example, is that he predicted that you should then see this galaxy imaged from this side and from this side. And if you think about it, what you expect to see is a circle in the sky. And so we've measured these just in the past few years. It took a, a century to get to this point, roughly, with exquisite telescopes post-Einstein. right? And finally, we've measured these amazing, we call them Einstein rings, which is due to the dark matter um, in this galaxy here, bending the light from one galaxy way behind it, and you see this beautiful circle in the sky. And we see this now not just on the scale of a galaxy, but also on a whole cluster of galaxies. Again, thousands of galaxies orbiting around each other, like you know, a swarm of bees or something, if you will, but held together by gravity. And we know that it's there because, again, we can see this amazing from one galaxy. If you look right, get the geometry right, you see this amazing ring. And the other images are distorted too. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing story. The dark matter has to be there. But the sad thing is that we have no theory as to what the dark matter is made of. It's most of the matter in the universe. It's surely some elementary particle, but it must interact really weakly with ordinary matter, we imagine, because you know, we don't have huge amounts of it on the Earth. Right? It's very, very sparse in the, in the solar system. But out there in the larger spaces, it's the dominant form. And we just do not know what it is. We're looking for it desperately, but so far we haven't seen it. So that's another example of our lack of knowledge at the moment. But again, you know, we've only been doing this for a few years, looking for it for a decade or thereabouts. And uh, there's a lot of time ahead of us. So again, I'm optimistic that we're going to um, be seeing this eventually. 
Okay. So now let me take you to another mystery, part of which we have made a lot of progress in. Um, and this is the birth of a star, and eventually the birth of a planet, and the birth of life. Okay, so let's just begin with a star. So what you're seeing here is a, is a dark cloud in the Milky Way. Uh, it, it's dark because it's full of dust and very, very cold, uh, lots of gas. And this is the womb for stars to form. Um, and we know this because with special telescopes designed to peer through the dust by looking in the infrared, we can see tiny stars forming. And this is an example of one of them, not in this particular cloud, but just I sort of proposed it for you. And you can see this actually is, 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 is a disk around this uh, bright thing in the middle. Um, uh, and it eventually it's going to condense, we think, into planets. So it's the birth it's a star actually being born, we're, we're convinced. Um, and we can see this, um, many examples of this around us now. And so this enables us to understand, you know, pretty much um, how stars are made. Um, and then the next thing we've been looking for are planets around all these other stars. So, you know, we have a few planets around the sun, right? The Earth being the one that we know has got life on, the only example of life on a planet in the entire universe that we have at the moment, okay? And, you know, we're on it. We're, it. we're, we're, the, we're the logical end product of that. In the solar system, there are a few other planets, but we don't think they're very congenial for life. Mercury, for example, you know, it's like an oven, basically. You can possibly imagine life. Venus, a um, bit further out, a bit less hot, but you have clouds of sulfuric acid. It's a nasty place to be. Uh, I don't think like, there's any life on Venus, the Earth, that's great. Mars, you know, uh, no, no atmosphere, it doesn't, no water. There is evidence there was once stuff in the past, water, rivers, maybe there was life on Mars a long time ago. That's why you want to go to Mars. Nothing much on the surface, but we have to dig deep in the surface of Mars and maybe we'll find evidence for fossil life. Who knows? One of the, but then beyond Mars, we've got, you know, giant planets like Jupiter. That's just a gigantic ball of methane and ammonia and stuff like that. Not exactly where you'd think uh, any life could be, and so on and so forth. Pluto, another ball of ice out there. But what we'd like to do is to look at other stars to get more examples. Okay? And so there are wonderful techniques now with new telescopes to look for planets around other stars. We call them exoplanets. And um, it's been a field that's developed incredibly rapidly over the past 20 years. And so, you know, the first exoplanet was discovered around, you know, just, just 20 years ago, actually. Um, and now we're up to several thousand of these planets around nearby stars. Um, and we find them just because with exquisite precision, you can see a dark spot, you know, projecting as a star. That's one example, occultation. In other ways, the star move, wobbles slightly and you infer it's, you know, it's due to a companion that you don't see, which is planet size and so forth. So lots of these planets. Now, some of these planets are much bigger than the Earth, um, and some of the planets are smaller than the Earth. Um, but there are an awful lot of stars out there. So this is a recent map um, um, by a satellite called Gaia, which mapped the positions in detail of billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. So each one of these stars most likely has many planets, just as the Earth, our Sun has many planets. So we're talking about in our own galaxy, let alone all the other galaxies out there. You know, there are many other billions of galaxies too. But in our own galaxy, within reach, as it were, of some, you know, future um, capability in rocketry, advanced rocketry, you can presumably traverse our galaxy. Um, in, you know, if we wait long enough, we'll do that um, in the future. There should be a lot of exoplanets. Um, around each of these stars. And the question then, how many of these are going to be like the Earth? Um, so here's uh, a, an example of our comparing the sizes of these planets. So you don't want the planet to be a massive ball of cold gas like Jupiter or a very hot rock like Mercury, and you want it to be roughly the right distance. So this just shows you the range that we have at the moment to compare... Um, um, uh, the Earth, this is the size of the Earth compared to Jupiter, Mars, etc. So here are the sizes of um, lots of e pl these planets we've been discovering over the past um, 20 years. And you can see we're just getting down to the point 
where we finally have the ability to measure Earth mass planets. So the early ones were Jupiter, the type of Jupiter, which were not interesting for life searches. But now we can measure Earth mass uh, planets. We have a few, quite a few of those. Uh, but that's not good enough, right? What you want are twins of the Earth, okay? You want planets which are at the right distance from their host sun, the host star, to be not too hot and not too cold, right? And basically also, but that's not all you want. That's, that's a starting point. You want them to have oxygen, atmospheres, and so forth, and, and water, liquid water. And then uh, when you have all of this stuff present, which in principle we have ways of detecting by searching for these signs on these planets very carefully, then maybe we would get closer to understanding if the, the right conditions for life elsewhere. Okay, um, so that takes me to my next uh, theme, which is that um, we would very much like to know um, how pervasive life is in the universe. That is to say, um, are we unique on the Earth? Did it happen just once? Or is there, a, given the right conditions, and with all these exoplanets, some are going to have the right conditions, that's, that's completely the same as the Earth, that's for sure, um, hundreds, thousands of them probably, uh, not, not the billions, that many of them are too hot and too cold, but we certainly have a few thousand out there that have potential you know, harbours of life, uh, if life could develop. And we have not the slightest idea, unfortunately, what basically triggers life. So first of all, um, this is the Goldilocks issue, but this is not a problem. Um, you want to make sure that you find a planet, and the, we're beginning to find them now, where conditions are just right. They're in what we call the habitable zone around their parent star, where it's not too cold and it's not too hot. And uh, the planet, you know, typically is going to be roughly Earth-sized. It's going to be a rocky planet, not a ball of gas, which it might be further out, um, or full of ice, etc. So, you know, we're, we're beginning just now to find these things. Okay, so, but we want more. So that's possible for life. So I'll come in a moment now to what it takes to make life. But what we really care about is not just life, okay? It's fine we find a, a planet full of, you know, bacteria or viruses. That's not terribly interesting. What we want is intelligent life because we, we'd ideally like to communicate with other, you know, beings in the universe. Um, if there are any aliens out there, it'd be great to, to develop something. We could learn a lot more science, more rapidly maybe, because if you think about it, you know, the sun, it's billions of years old, but our, there are stars out there that are billions of years older than the sun. Many, most stars are older than the sun. The sun is, you know, roughly a, an adolescent on the, you know, compared to our galaxy. There are older stars out there, many of them, which would have planets, and those planets would have a, a big advantage over the Earth. So um, if um, we know life happened once on the Earth, okay, it occurred once, but the question now is, you know, is it more common? And, and if it were more common, then it could have a big advance over anything that happened on the Earth, except for one rather sad possibility that we are rapidly destroying the Earth, as, as we all know, right? So, you know, it's not clear that we will leave the Earth behind after we've finished polluting it, et cetera, et cetera, or having nuclear wars or whatever may happen, you know, in the, in the next century or two, that, that we will have a very uh, stable, you know, and advancing uh, uh, you know, civilization. We, we have, you know, we don't know. Okay, um, right, so let's now come back to the story of how likely life is. So the pioneer was Darwin, of course, and, and this is a, a sketch that he made on his initial uh, cruise around the world, sort of Galapagos and other places, in which he invented what we now call the tree of life. He called it the tree of life too. And the, so the idea is there was some universal common ancestor, um, and from that, um, that would have been some simple organism, actually, and from that developed all these various um, uh, more complicated things, um, from bacteria to fish to mammals, eventually to man. So, so let me... Um, Here's a beautiful quote um, from Darwin. So he, he imagined this, um, uh, this warm little mud pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity. 
and the protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, and that could be how life began. That was the vision, and we still have that vision, pretty much. So first of all, um, around the time of Darwin, uh, um, one of his fellow scientists developed this slightly um, uh, more sophisticated version of the tree of life, and, um, and in it you can see uh, we basically... Um, have you know plants and um, uh, bacteria type things and um, animals and with man somewhere at the top of that tree and here's a modern more colourful view of the same thing um, where you see um, the simple si single celled organisms and the bacteria which are maybe closely um, the most closely related things to the um, universal common ancestor, right, of, of all life, right, the cells that form first life in this primordial mud pond on the earth, you know. Um, okay, and we need, we need water. That's critical to have the cells move around together to protect you from the ultraviolet. That's where the mud comes in. And um, those are the sort of ingredients that are the proteins to mix and build up more complex stuff. And eventually, uh, lo and behold, you finally get up to algae and plants and um, on one of these... Um, uh, and the fungi, which are truly very important in, the, in this school of things. And then finally we have, you know, um, us emerging from all of this. Okay. Um, so, um, fine. So we cannot, we do not know scientifically what the odds of this happening are. Uh, but it's reasonable to speculate that, um, you know, it happened once, that's for sure. And given the conditions that I've, uh, imagined, Darwin imagined, it could happen on other planets and now we have all these other exoplanets, twins of the Earth out there, we'll, uh, we'll have many more soon. And there are probably millions of these possible sites for life in, in our galaxy. So um, let's um, ask the following question. Suppose it were true, we can't calculate this, but suppose it were true that life really was common out there in the universe and on other exoplanets, and that, you know, it had, in many cases, a huge advance on us, right? Millions, even billions of years. It didn't self-destruct. Life was clever enough to, to survive and advance and become, you know, scientists became clever and clever of the generations, and the computers would come to that, the second got bigger and bigger, etc. So travel was no problem for them. So the question is, where are they, right? They should, we, they should be around here somewhere these advanced aliens. And so this question was first asked by a physicist called Enrico Fermi, who was one of the fathers of the atomic bomb, incidentally. But, you know, he did other things too. And um, he, he remarked, um, don't you ever wonder where everybody is, right? If there are all these advanced aliens out there, they should be propagating around the galaxy like crazy in highly advanced spacecraft, and they might have come to talk to us. Maybe they, they wouldn't have a language in common, but they might have left some artifacts that we you know. Um, and so he then you know, did a series of um, uh, what we call back-of-the-envelope calculations. And he said, at the end of the day, you know, um, they should have been here many, many times. The fact that we haven't seen them and found no evidence of them means that they do not exist. Okay, so that was the conclusion from the lack of visitations, okay. Now, um, over the years, we've tried to make this argument more quantitative, right, to calculate, um, you know, how many such civilizations there might be. Would there really be so many coming to the Earth, or could it have been a, a rarer thing, right? So this is um, uh, a radio astronomer called Frank Drake wrote down an equation, famously known after him. And this equation purports to calculate how many advanced civilizations there are out there on distant planets, on distant stars. And so it involves things like um, the number of planets like the Earth, um, uh, the lifetime of any civilization on such a planet allowing for its possible self-destruction um, and all the other various factors, not being too far from its host star, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the trouble with this calculation is that you can imagine that every factor in it, except maybe the number of exoplanets, which we're finally beginning to get a hold on, every other factor is totally unknown. 
So if you start multiplying you know, unknown quantities by unknown quantities, you don't really get very far. So that means that we just don't know how to calculate our response to Fermi's question, where are they? Um, maybe they're very few. And of course, another answer might be that these highly advanced civilizations have learned, you know, we're just a zoo for them, you know, the human zoo. And maybe we, they've developed in such a way that, you know, we wouldn't notice them. You know, they, they would be communicating in some dimension that we cannot yet understand and being invisible to us. That, that's another option that we have no, no, no way around. Okay. Okay, so um, there's another point I want to make. So I've said, you know, could humanity be a unique fluke, an accident? Um, that I've talked about. Is there alien life in the universe? We've said a bit about that. But there's another aspect to this, which is um, intelligence and consciousness, right, which differs, makes us different from animals. And so if you want to explore the origins of life, you have to... S you have to worry a little bit about not just whether there could be life out there, whether how it developed, you know, intelligence, etc. And so, what I'd like to argue is that this is not really such a major problem, um, I think. But it's highly debated among my among my colleagues, and I'm no me by no means an expert. I mean, this is the realm of neuroscientists among others. But let me just give you a brief overview. And so, the question is: um, Does the brain, the human brain, um, development of that? eventually engender consciousness. Well, obviously they go together. But what about, you know, animals? Um, you know, your pet dog, is, is, your, is your dog or your cat conscious in the way? Can it, you know, recognize itself in a mirror? I, I don't think so, actually. Um, be self-aware that it's seeing another dog. Um, so here's an experiment that's been done on um, mice, actually, in the laboratory. So in, a, in, a, in the brain of a mice, which is much like our brain, just a smaller version, um, there are these brain cells and they fire electrical pulses called synapses. And, um, and you can study uh, uh, a, a mouse walking around with micro cameras, etc. This was done by the Allen Institute for Brain Science in the US. And you count the number of synapses and the, and the mouse brain has something like 10 million of these flashes, electrical flashes going on at any time. And so that is the degree of complexity of a mouse. The mouse sort of stops here and sniffs for a bit and moves on, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one can upgrade this. To the, well, we haven't done the experiments on the human brain. But, you know, it's much the same. Uh, many, many brain cells, many synapses. Um, and the numbers are a lot larger. So it's about 1,000 trillion okay, synapses in the human brain. Millions and millions of times more complicated than the mouse brain. Okay, so that's for sure. Um, but... The point I want to make is that these flashes, these electrical cells, are something that we're able now to try to replicate with computers. These numbers are not uh, are of order of what we can do artificially. Now, it does get a little complicated because um, these um, brain cells are not randomly arranged. They're, they're in... They're, they're in um, uh, lines and things, uh, uh, and, and, and nerve, nerves actually that spread things out. And so all this makes it very, very complicated. It's more than just, what I'm going to tell you is a highly simplistic version. It's more than just counting numbers. But to give you the flavor of the thing, let's count numbers. So here is the most powerful computer, supercomputer on the earth, okay? It's in um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, at one of the U.S. national labs. So the the, the Ch Chinese held the record the year before, etc. They'll hold it next year. But right now it's the U.S. that has the record. And this particular supercomputer can do uh, more, almost as many operations as the human brain in terms of these uh, uh, operations, these synapses that I, I, I call them. Um, so basically it's, um, let me try to get my trillions right. Um, this is 10,000 trillion bits, bytes, that this thing can do. Operations, multiplications, if you like, at the, instantaneous, at the same time. So that's one. So that tells you that right now, the computer, and this computer is the size of two tennis courts, so we're not going to talk about stuffing this one inside the human brain, but computers like this have similar power uh, to the human brain, except that it's more than just brute force, of course. The human brain, as I said, has these cell these synapses carefully arranged. It's much more complex than just doing random numbers. But 
well, you know, we have to think about what the future may hold for us. So this is, you know, 2019 that we're looking at this. So I would bet you that within 20 years' time, for example, if you remember, we'll miniaturize this. So remember the size of what was the most powerful computer in, say, 1950, when we first you know, developed in the UK and elsewhere. Those computer filled entire rooms, and they now can inf- fit inside your mobile phone or less, right? So we've learned how to miniaturize. So I would expect that within not that many decades, we're miniaturizing supercomputers like this to fit inside you know, the human brain or a brain or, you know, so one can presumably replace our brains eventually by, by computer transplants, et cetera. Um, so this gets us into interesting territory. Um, if you project ahead, right now in brute force, this may be compared to the brain in power, in brute power, but nowhere at all in the sophistication that's needed. But that will happen in the future as, as humans can become more powerful. So this leads us into um, the other related question, which is we, one can imagine a future in which well, computers, basically, um, if, if dominate everything. So if you think of a human with an, an, a computer brain, it's a robot, basically. So robots at some point in the future, within some people say within 30 years, I would give it a few hundred years, whatever, will basically be able to replicate everything the human brain can do and do far more. And that can only get more and more complicated in the future. In the future. So this leads us then to... Um, what would one do with these amazing, um, amazing computing systems? So this has led to the birth of studies of a field called nanotechnology, which we're beginning to exploit um, in fa- fabricating um, you know, cosmetics, for example, the various things. But basically the idea of this goes, g- goes back to um, Richard Feynman, one of the greatest um, physicists of all time, um, who realized that you can rearrange atoms in principle. He, he didn't actually do this. It was, it was a concept he had, um, the, the way you want. And so this means that you can suddenly, if you can rearrange the atoms all the way down to atomic scales, you can suddenly do things. Um, and so you can make um, mass-produce things identically to, to each other. You can produce factories, basically, that would make things, anything you like, if you can learn how to rearrange the atoms. And this, um, and so, and everyone will be a perfect copy of everyone else. Um, so this concept has been called, is called nanotechnology. And um, it's been um, applied by thinkers about the future, futurists, to um, imagine um, how you would take advantage of this. So, this, uh, for example, what, what one idea was that the, these um, mini factories of arranged atoms able to, to think and do things, to take photos, to do miniature operations, for example, could roam throughout our bodies, invading cancerous cells, rearranging their DNA. They could cure cancer, right, but vaguely. And they could also, nanotechnology has been imagined, you can make mini factories by having so many of these atoms replicate themselves and replicate machines, you can imagine constructing buildings. So imagine this. Um, they might swarm as a barely visible metallic sheen over an outdoor construction site. In a few days, an elegant building would take shape. Every hour, entire factories no larger than a grain of sand might generate billions of machines like a mass of dust streaming steadily from the factory door. So this is the future of nanotechnology in principle. We, there's no law of physics that says this cannot happen, and it just seems likely if you think what might happen in 100 years' time. Now, um, so we've discussed brains, um, systems that are much more powerful than the human brain. So the other thing you have to worry about is, is this, I showed you some advantages, but this could be a bad thing too. There are downsides to this as well, and, and some of my colleagues worry about this. Um, so um, are, are they um, a threat to humanity or a boon to humanity? And the aliens out there, who, if they are there, would have had so many more millions of years than us to evolve, by this argument, they should all be basically... Um, Robots, the word used is post-biological, right? They, they will have, you know, they, they, will, they will be outnumbering any, you know, rare 
um, human type beings among them or um, uh, so th this seems hard to avoid so there have been um, various books about this um, recently um, in the past uh, so the, the, the trend began um, with um, Ray Kurzweil who is an engineer who works for Google actually and so he forecast that within um, a decade or two um, artificial intelligence would overpower the human brain and um, uh, he called this, um, uh, you know, a, a threshold, a future threshold. And once one got into this um, production of artificial intelligence, things would then exponentiate. We start doubling every year. If, you know, there would be nothing to stop the, the rise and the spread of this um, increasingly perfected intelligence superior to our own. He called this the singularity. Um, another um, of my Oxford colleagues, a philosopher Nick Bustrom, has worried a lot about the negative sides of negative aspects of this and, and forecast doom and gloom um, uh, because um, humanity as we know it would possibly be at risk. Um, the, uh, the downside of this might be to destroy certain things. Uh, not everyone agrees. Here's one of my fellow Gresham lecturers who gave a lecture, lecture last week, um, he, some of you may have heard, who has a very positive thing. He thinks the positive aspects outweigh the negative aspects. But um, the basic problem is what one has called the grey goo problem. So let me uh, just summarise. This is the end point of nanotechnology. Um, so... Within a few decades, machine intelligence will surpass human intelligence. Implications include the merger of biological and non-biological intelligence. Immortal, immortality awaits for us. So that's Ray Kurzweil's view. But the Bustrom view is, um, is more bleak. Um, we humans are like small children playing with a bomb, he writes. Our demise may result from the habitat destruction and choose when artificial intelligence begins massive global construction projects using nanotechnology factories that'll just destroy the environment. So we'll be left with, uh, uh, you know, it'll be the ultimate catastrophe for, um, for um, what we know and love on the earth. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me sort of um, begin to close with uh, the words of another great thinker about the future. Um, again, let's take a more positive view about what this may hold. So what any futuristic advanced civilization must use is energy. Okay? Um, and named after Freeman Dyson, there are Dyson spheres. And these are um, thought to be a way of cap capturing the energy from the sun. Now, the sun's energy is wonderful. Solar energy is the great energy of the future. But think about it, most of it gets, gets wasted. It just goes off into space. A tiny fraction accepts the Earth. And in a country like Germany now, we have 40% of their energy is now solar. The UK is rapidly developing as solar cells become you know, lower, despite the weather in Germany. That seems to work. But you know, the, the future, that's the way it will go. But if you could imagine a, a, a advanced civilization, they would capture much more from their sun. And then we could look for these by seeing weirdly glowing spheres in space far away, stars that aren't really stars but are so much bigger than their host star buried inside the Dyson sphere of, of capturing devices that then recycle the energy that they would just have a different signature. And so that... Um, <clears throat> This conversion of starlight into infrared photons would be a way of looking for advanced civilizations. We're exploring this option. No one has found one yet, but you know, we are just beginning to develop our advanced infrared telescopes. And then what about the aliens? Okay, um, so how would they find us? Okay, interesting question. Um, this is how the Earth looks. Uh, Earth rise on the moon. I imagine this is one reason you'd want to go to moon when uh, hotels will be built there in 20 years' time to, to spend a night and watch, uh, watch Earth rise. be an amazing experience, I'm sure. But the Earth cannot hide, okay? So this is the Earth at night. So this is one way the Earth will reveal itself as an intelligent base because this is not, you know, random fluctuations of fireflies, right? This is, you know, electrical illumination of uh, vast cities. Um, so we can't hide ourselves. So again, if there were advanced civilizations out there, they would certainly be able to. Um... 
Okay, so um, how do we cope with all of this? Well, so um, here's one interesting story. Um, uh, you could imagine um, immortality, I said, is one of the hopes eventually from, you know, eventually uh, replacing our brains with artificial brains. I mean, that, that will come eventually, I suppose. But what about the people now? What can you do? Well, there's a company in Boston that will offer to freeze you uh, after you die um, and conserve you, uh, you know, alternative to being, you know, having your ashes dropped in the sea or something, that this is designed to crash you, freeze you, and then wake you up 100,000 years later, um, and there you are. You'll be able to, uh, you know, be reinvigorated, no doubt, by the advanced technology. So, of course, this assumes the company doesn't go bankrupt in the meantime. But nevertheless, um, here's examples of these pods. They actually have um, in Boston, in this company. And um, here's another example of my colleagues in Oxford um, who have paid a certain sum. The company charges about $50,000 for, for this. Uh, <clears throat> and so they, they, they've paid to be um, cryogenically uh, conserved when they die. And there's a cut price for head only. And you can see that uh, two of my colleagues, including uh, that Nick Boster I mentioned earlier, have, you know, uh, just, will just have their heads frozen when they die. So anyway, that, that's um, one thing philosophers are doing. These are philosophers to... Um, <laughs> To not, perhaps not as practical people to, to worry about um, how to cope with the, the future there. Okay, so let me close with this. Um, these ideas go back a very long way, okay, about what else there is out there. Um, so I'm going to just quote a couple of very wise um, Greek f philosopher scientists. Uh, it's in the highest degree unlikely this earth and sky is the only one to have been created. Nothing in the universe is the only one of its kind. That was Lucretius and um, Metrodorus, um, also, you know, 4th century BC. To consider the Earth as the only populated world in infinite space is a, as absurd as to assert that an entire field sown with millet only one grain will grow. So, you know, beautiful words. We still cannot prove any of this, be sure of any of this. And the only answer, I think, is that we have to look. Okay, so we have to keep on searching for these exoplanets, looking for signs of, of life on them eventually, which we can do with advanced telescopes. And who knows, if we're clever enough, we may even find signs that there's more than just you know, um, oxygen in the atmospheres. There may be even signs such as you know, lights flickering or whatever, Dyson spheres, signs of intelligent life. We, we simply don't know. We have to look. So I encourage all of you to, to support our scientists, astronomers who are out there worrying about what else there is in the universe. And um, maybe they'll tell us something someday. So thank you.